Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'll just continue from where I left off yesterday. And where, where we were um, was I was giving you sort of, um, sort of a brief description of how you model the accretion disk. So first I showed you how the formation of an uh, accretion disk is really quite inevitable, pretty much around <clears throat> every compact object. But remember, in particular, we are focusing on supermassive black holes here. And so, and the disk structure I mentioned to you um, is a convenient, it turns out, it's a convenient way to move angular momentum out for the infalling gas and pushing the mass in. And of course, in order to have that, in order to have, to accomplish those flows of angular momentum out and matter in, um, you need some kind of microphysical mechanism, which we don't. But what we do have is a parameterization for the structure of this accretion disk in which the source of viscosity, shearing viscosity, really arises from between two neighboring layers. If you think of the, uh, of the assembly of the accretion disk and think of them as annuli of gas sort of you know, radially arranged, then the friction, if you will, the viscosity that's generated, the shearing between neighboring layers is what generates heat, dissipates, and produces an unbalanced torque. So here's a little um, diagram that shows you that when you look at the annulus, and this is the direction of the flow, that you know um, at radius r, and you look at incrementally r minus lambda, r plus lambda, then you can actually calculate the torque on the inner end. And the torque is relevant because it's really the torque that gets to move the mass in, right? And um, and so this, this sort of general mechanism, remember we were talking about these cascading scales. So this is still sort of you know, well outside Schwarzschild radius, 10 to the three to 10 to the five times Schwarzschild radius, right? So at this point, remember I told you that the challenge has been at every stage, figuring out how to get the gas in to the next stage, the next stage as it were. And so for this stage, we now have this prescription, which is called the alpha prescription. So alpha is just the coefficient of viscosity of this model. And this model is um, Shakura Sunyaev's model from the 1970s, from 1974. And it turns out that this parameterization, you might say, well, that's kind of old. But this parameterization actually works for now, in particular, since we don't have any more insights into the microphysics. We don't know, for example, at the molecular level what might be happening in the secretion disk. We don't have a model for that. So this parameterized model works really rather well. And the model, as you can imagine, what we're going to do is we're going to write out the disk evolution equation, right? And that's where we're going with uh, setting up the various terms in the disk evolution equation. So one can look at the dissipation per unit area, sort of, of the face area of the disk in a steady thin disk. And some of the key assumptions here are that this coefficient of viscosity nu is proportional to lambda times v. So this, I told you, these are the sets of parametric assumptions that allow you to do the modeling. So what we're going to assume here about the structure of the disk, if may, you may remember that one key parameter was the disk scale length over r is a characteristic. So it tells you something about the thickness of the disk. And so we're going to restrict ourselves to thin accretion disks where the disk scale length, h over r, is much, much less than 1. And, um, and the reason for that is then we can use very simple parametric models for the surface mass density of the disk, sigma of r, and so on. So it just permits a very nice sort of simple um, set of equations. And it corresponds, as we talked about, so this is the kind of optimal feeding disk. So this would correspond to being able to feed the black hole via the Eddington limit. So that sort of self-consistently kind of hangs together. This is a geometry that would permit optimal accretion. And therefore, the accretion would be Eddington limited for a thin accretion disk, right? So it's a self-consistent set of assumptions, yeah. Pardon? Yeah, so that actually, so lambda is really chosen in simulations. You do idealized simulations of disks, and you choose a lambda that then permits you to connect the m dot at the outer edge and the m dot at the inner edge of the disk. Okay, so you want a certain mass inflow rate, and 
one can then adjust these parameters depending on what inflow rate you want to accommodate, right? So typically, if you assume a central source, like if you assume a supermassive black hole in the center, and you want to model an Eddington limited uh, accretion, so then you know what the M dot is that you have to provide. Yes, Sajid? What, what makes it really nice? What, what makes this a difficult measure Well, it's, it's not clear that what you can measure, so in, in the plasma and lab experiments doesn't quite settle into this kind of structure, right? So you need a very strong gravitational field that would, that would um, allow an equilibrium settling of this disk. And so it's not, I mean, there are though, I mean, this is a really good question because there are, quite, there are analogs of accretion disks that people do in tabletop experiments. So, but they're hydrodynamic analogs, not quite plasma. So what they have is they would have a vortex around which you can model the flows. But um, you don't quite get this structure. And in fact, those tabletop experiments tell you more about more realistic situations. I mean, this is an idealized kind of situation, right? So when people look at geometrically thick disks and um, accretion modes, there are many, many different kinds of accretion modes. So there's radiatively efficient, radiatively inefficient you know, uh, modes. And each of those corresponds, they're magnetically arrested, there are mad disks, there are sane disks models, there are all kinds of disk models. And for each one of them, the interesting thing is that the accretion flow is tied to the geometry, the shape of the disk, the disk torus, blob, whatever you end up having in the center. But um, in this case, what you find is this is just a convenient and easy, and we've all stuck to this. And, and I think a lot of the theorists like this partly because of the self-consistency with uh, Eddington rates and the fact that you can do pretty much, you can go quite far analytically to understand what's going on. Then, of course, you have to do things numerically. So then, um, so if the disk is really confined to the orbital plane with the semi-thickness h, then we can write out the surface density of the disk as the integral of the three-dimensional density along, integrated along the z direction. And that um, is 2h times the mean density. And you can write out things in, you, know, you can choose cylindrical polar or spherically, um, uh, 3D spherical coordinates. But this is uh, a convenient choice because of the geometry. And then you see that the Keplerian velocity, v phi, the component v phi is v Keplerian. And that just falls off as the compact mass proportional to m to the 1 halves over r to the 1 halves. So the, the nice thing about this is that, I told you, right, is that this is a way to make a nice, simple, self-consistent model. And in this model, that the pressure forces are really negligible. So in terms of when we write out the disk evolution equations, that we can actually ignore uh, the pressure. And so, um, yeah, so I just actually finished talking about this, that this mechanism is referred to this uh, transfer mechanism, the transfer of angular momentum, which is needed to finally get the mass to trickle onto the compact object, um, is called viscosity. Because as I told you, any kind of molecular process that we can think about, that we can model, just cannot be as effective as we would like it to be for the black hole feeding case. So we don't really have a microscopic model that works. So um, we can figure out, I, I won't spend too much time on every equation, but essentially I want to show you what the elements of the model are. It's a very simple model, so you can just go work out for yourself what the equations are, work through them. But um, as I said, the key, this is sort of the key feature of the shakura sunya model, that the coefficient of viscosity is proportional uh, to the velocity. And this lambda is a typical length scale, and um, as per the question, right, that's something that um, you can calibrate with a set of simulations, idealized uh, dissolution models, depending on the inflow rate that you really want, for example. And that, in turn, uh, is what you choose that's permitted, say, by Eddington accretion. So then, you know, basically the torque does some work, and then there's a transport of um, rotational energy, that is sort of what we want. And then there is dissipation, on both sides of the disk, both faces. And then we can actually write out the dissipation term. So you might see why are we obsessed with the dissipation term? Because you know, ultimately what we want to do is we want to connect the dissipation term that you get from this model to the spectral distribution, spectral energy distribution. So you want to go from here because the dissipation is the energy that is radiated out. And then we will fit that to an actual SCD of an accretion disk, right? So that's the, that's the chain here. 
And so you can write out mass conservation equation and angular con uh, momentum conservation with the torque term included. You can eliminate the radial velocity. And simply, basically, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for a disk evolution equation. So how d sigma dt, how sigma changes as a function of time. And so this is the diffusion equation for the surface mass density. And so essentially, this tells you that mass uh, diffuses in and angular momentum out. And the diffusion time scale, the typical time scale uh, for this process to occur is the viscous time scale, which is R squared over this coefficient of viscosity. Okay, so um, as I said, I'm not going to spend time doing um, a lot of the derivations. They are given in a couple of, you know, they're standard textbook material now, and you can find them. I particularly like this version, which is a review article from 2007. And don't worry, nothing must have changed in the thin accretion model from 2007. It's pretty much still... Um, okay, so then you might want to look at sort of steady thin disk because one of the things we want is we want the black hole to be fed steadily because you want to actually grow it, right? So one can work out what the steady uh, solutions are and those you get by setting DDT to zero. And then when you integrate the mass conservation equation, you find that this quantity R sigma VR um, is constant. And this is clearly related to the uh, accretion rate via this equation. And so the angular momentum conservation, on the other hand, gives you that. And essentially, where we are, what we are after, as I told you, is the form of the dissipation term. And ideally, we wanted to rewrite the dissipation term in terms of the mass of the supermassive black hole and the inflow rate, accretion rate. So that's accomplished now. Right, so this is the dissipation. And now this energy, this term, is what gives you the energy that you know will be coming out with a given SCD, okay, around the AGN. And so then, you know, you can look at the limits. Remember, we looked very, we did a, a hand wavy calculation in the beginning when we said, okay, what are the typical wavelengths in which this dissipated energy would actually come out and be radiated? And one of the limits was black body. So if this, if the entire dissipated uh, dissipation comes out uh, as a black body, so you can treat the whole dis disk as a black body with some temperature TB, then you can figure out what that temperature is. And what is convenient about this, once again, is that we've written all the quantities of interest in terms of the variables that we are really, uh, that are key to the problem, which is mass of the black hole and the accretion rate, okay? So, um, but notice one night, yeah. Yeah, that's right, but that's the assumption. Yeah, that's a good point. So there's a correction for all of that that we eventually make. But by and large, it is not such a, such a bad uh, description, as you'll see in a minute. Yeah, so um, it, it turns out when you will, I mean, this is just the analytic form. When you actually solve and do the full numerical thing, you are not going to make this assumption. So this is just the toy model, right? Okay, it's an idealized case. So now one nice thing that you notice in this assumption of uh, assuming that the disk is a black body is that you find that the black body temperature becomes independent of viscosity, new drops out. So which is why we don't worry so much that we don't understand what new is. Because for the most, so this is, this is relevant for the observable, for the actual temperature and for the spectrum that we're going to get from the accretion disk. So the fact that this hand wavy coefficient of viscosity has dropped out is what allows us, has permitted us to continue using these models. Because, you know, it, it really doesn't matter what the interpretation was. Of course, in detail it matters, the physics matters, but um, here, this uh, particular uh, parametrization works, and it's convenient, and it kind of nicely drops out. So um, the, this T black body, as we said, you know, this is sort of effectively deducible from the spectrum of these accreting objects. And um, so you can then look at, you can solve the equation, you can, you can play around their analytic simple equations, you can play, the, play around with them in the limiting cases. So one limiting case is that H is much, much less than R. So it's an extremely thin disk, right? And, and it's almost hydrostatic in the Z direction. And because then the disk scale length and in the Z direction, the extent is really small, you can then figure out what the, um, what dp, dz, what the pressure gradient is. And what you find, we know that the pressure is basically, 
uh, row times the sound speed square. So this is basically it tells you something about disturbances in this disk. So if you have disturbances in this disk, which will propagate at the speed of sound, the question is how, how do we model that? So that's why we're sort of interested uh, in figuring it out. So then what you find is for a thin disk, we, we can see, just moving things around a little bit, that the local Keplerian velocity has to be highly supersonic okay, for a thin disk. So you can see that by this rearranging, that it's Cs over Vk times R, right? And that because, that's because you want H to be much, much smaller than R, which means this number has to be very, very large. So it's highly supersonic compared to sort of um, uh, speed of sound, therefore. Now, Cs, the speed of sound, as you know, is t to the half. And this means that basically the disk can cool. So you can dissipate energy. Your temperature could go down. Um, and, the, um, and the way it, um, you lose energy is determined by, by the sound speed. So what you can, for this model, and the reason why we're doing this is we want to extract all relevant time scales, right? So we looked at one time scale, which is, comes out of this viscosity, which is R squared over nu, that's the viscous time scale. So because we want to look again at perturbations. When we perturb the steady disk, then how do perturb what are the relevant time scales for uh, the perturbations? So of course, there's another time scale that we know is very important, and that's the dynamical time scale. And that dynamical time scale, as you all know, is just R over Vk, the Keplerian velocity. And so now we have these two time scales. And then because you have dissipation, and we are permitting dissipation, and we know what D of R is, the dissipation, we can also define a thermal time scale, right? So a, a, a loss time scale, if you will, thermal energy loss time scale. So it turns out, because of the dependencies on H over R and R, that the dynamical time scale is the shortest one, shorter than the thermal time scale, is shorter than um, the viscous time scale. Okay? So what this tells you, when we are looking at the propagation of perturbations in an accretion disk, it tells you how long it will take for the disk to actually settle down into a steady state, what, how the perturbations will travel through the disk, uh, and so tomorrow I'll show you a little movie when, where I will show you um, sort of this idealized sort of accretion disk and we will be looking at the perturbations, the various modes that you can set up in these disks. And these modes are basically regions where you, have, you introduce density inhomogeneities. So that's where the dissipation will occur. So that's where you have radiation coming out. And when we were talking yesterday about, you know, the electromagnetic counterparts for binary black hole mergers, if the merger is aided by an accretion disk, this is the kind of model that you use for the accretion disk to find out what happens when you drop a secondary black hole. It will introduce perturbations in the disk. And those disk perturbations will propagate and re release energy. And that is what we're see we will be seeing as electromagnetic counterparts. And they're very clear spectral signatures. And that's what we're calculating now. There's, they have clear spectral signatures because you know, the dissipation depends on mass of the black hole, accretion rate, et cetera, et cetera. Right? OK, so then the question is, um, what about the self-gravity? So the, the self-gravity of the accretion disk is important because you can use that to set the size limit. Because remember, we are trying to kind of um, come up with a set of simple, self-consistent kind of prescriptions for the accretion disk. So then you can actually calculate to see how the size of the accretion disk can be set by argument self-gravity. And then you can see that basically self-gravity will take over when rho is proportional to m over r cubed or that the disk mass, therefore, has to be r squared h of rho. And so the disk will basically break up into stars outside of this. So outside of this region, all the assumptions that we have made don't really hold. So that limits the size of the accretion disk region, where we can assume that we have a nice, steady, thin disk, and we have the flows that we want. So this delimits where our assumption will no longer work. Okay, so now we know the limits of our model quite well. And, uh, and of course, there are many open questions that you can try to ask with this. Um, uh, and uh, for example, what happens to the angular momentum of the central object itself as it accretes mass? So it's of course going to depend on whether the gas is delivered in a prograde orbit or a retrograde orbit. Um, and so on. But what we do know is that there is 
you know, one of the key variables for black holes, right? One of the key uh, uh, features of the Schwarzschild solution for black hole is that basically you have the mass, the angular momentum, the spin, and the charge. So charge is astrophysically irrelevant, but the spin is really important. So it's a key property of the black hole. And you, and you can have a maximal spin um, that is A is approximately one is the maximal spin that you can have. And so what you really ideally want to do when you do these models is that not only do you want to siphon mass in and keep track of the mass assembly of the central object, but you also want to keep track of the spin evolution, ideally. So, but you know, that, that involves much more hand waving to get there. But, you know, ideally you would want to do that, okay? And, and so the question is when uh, in an accreting um, black hole, in a typical AGN, if you have a, you know, sizable mass gain, so very high supply rate and you are growing fast, the question is does the black hole always spin up? And so I have a little toy problem here that um, I will just skip through and you can take a look in the notes, yep. It could, depending on the inner. So this is a big open question, which is the, um, the question of not so much the spin, but the angular momentum and the alignment of the spin is sort of the issue. So we now believe that the, uh, the time scale for alignment of the spin of the black hole with the inner accretion disk is actually quite short. So they end up lining up. And it's a fairly short time scale, but you know, um, and, and the reason why you want to worry about the time scale is that remember, we've all been talking about how structure assembly, assembly in the universe is through mergers and so on. So you want that to be short compared to the time between mergers, because that will disrupt the nuclear region. So it turns out, luckily, that it looks like the alignment time scale for the inner part of the accretion disk is actually short. And it turns out that the inner part of the accretion disk is actually somewhat decoupled from the outer part of the accretion disk. So you, you can very easily, and you do very easily produce warps. So you have the inner part that is lined up with the black hole, and the outer part is not yet lined up. So you will have a warp. And these kinds of warped accretion disks are signatures of those in terms of you know, signatures in spectra are seen. So the simple model can actually give you that. But the question is the alignment time scale. Um, and we think that it all kind of hangs together because the time scale is short in the inner regions. Yeah. In the last slide, you mentioned the spin. Uh, and you mentioned that the, you need to track the spin also. Pardon? Uh, you mentioned the tracking of the spin also, right? If I understood correctly, you mean the spin evolution of the black hole, right? Pardon, during the mass evolution of the black uh, hole. Yeah. So, um, uh, what is the difference of time scale between the mass infall and the spin evolution? I would expect it to be much different, right? No, they're not. So that's the thing. They are actually fair. The reason you can track them simultaneously is that the inflow rates, um, which I remember it's a sort of the saltpeter uh, 10 to the 7, few times 10 to the 7, um, um, uh, is the years, is the inflow rate typical time scale. It turns out that the alignment time scale is also between 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8. So they are well aligned, which is why you can kind of use one as a proxy to model the other. Yeah. Alignment um, uh, rated. That I understand. Pardon? You said the uh, yeah. time scale of alignment. alignment. Now I'm saying the time scale of evolution of the spin of the black hole. That will be very small compared to the infall rate, right? Uh, what do you mean by the evolution of the spin of so the black hole? The, the change in spin when you accrete some matter. Yes. Right. So that can be assumed to be almost uh, instantaneous. Uh -huh. However, it is the it is the fact that it's the alignment, the time scales being similar, that allows you to model every time mass is delivered. How does the spin change? Did that answer? So you know, this is a toy problem for motion near a point mass. I'm just going to go over it very quickly, take a look later. Um, what this is really um, allowing you to see is to uh, give you the definition. Most of you would have seen this already. This is basic dynamics. But let me just get to why I was doing it. So this is looking at the motions around a, a point mass. And um, you're looking at the, um, we are looking at uh, a definition for the innermost stable circular orbit, right? 
And so this basically around for motion right around the black hole. Now, what I'm trying to do is that I'm, I brought the gas in right to the edge of the accretion disk, and now I want to plop it, right? So I'm really trying to get as close as I can. And so here we have another simple way of thinking about um, the description, the spatial description of how far in we can actually bring the gas elements, right? And so for that, what is really relevant is the fact that there exists an innermost stable circular orbit. And so around a black hole, you know that the circular speed cannot exceed C. Basically, the circular speed can never really exceed C. And the effective potential does not have a minima um, inside a certain radius. So it, this is the peculiarity of the shape of the potential of a point mass. So that's what the earlier slides were supposed to show you. So the innermost stable orbit, circular orbit, the ISCO radius will obviously depend on the spin, um, the spin angular momentum of the hole. And so this is the definition of that dimensionless spin parameter that I was talking about earlier, where I said A can be maximally one, okay. So, um, so that, that's that. So now I, can, I have showed you how we can build a model. We can bring the gas in from fairly large radius through an accretion disk structure all the way in to the ISCO, okay? So that's where we are. We can, that's how we can model. That's as close as we get. So then let's move on to a few other aspects of the problem that are going to be relevant to then integrate all of this into sort of an evolutionary picture uh, with the evolution of um, the assembly of galaxies and halos and so on and so forth. So the question then is where are black holes? Where do the supermassive black holes sit? We've assumed they're always central. They're sitting there. And what happens during mergers when you have a secondary that comes in, or you have a supermassive in the center, and then you have a lot of lower mass black holes that are around, what is the dynamics of that? Because you remember, we are trying to do all the pieces of the problem. We're looking at the feeding, we're looking at the dynamics, and then we're gonna put everything together um, in these sort of simple models. So essentially what we want to see, uh, this is dynamical friction. So as all of you know, the a moving mass is slowed by the gravitational wake that is generated when uh, you're moving through a mass density sort of, uh, of say stars, right? So this is the black hole is moving along a density distribution of stars. There's a gravitational wake. And I think this shading, maybe you can see it, maybe you can't quite, gives you an idea of what the gravitational wake. So there's a breaking that you get from when you move. And so as you all know, some of the, the first sort of very beautiful calculation, detailed calculation of this was done by Chandrasekhar. Um, and he looked at the um, effect, the slowing down, the drag, the DVDT, it's a drag, so it's a minus sign, um, that is produced from this motion from the gravitational wave. So you can write out the equation of motion and, and you can then see what is the typical time scale that it takes uh, for the mass to spiral into the center of mass of a, of a system, right? And the thing to note here is uh, the various dependencies, right? So it depends on one over the mass of the central object. Remember, all the time we're trying to keep track of how um, uh, it works, how things work either with black hole properties, accretion rate, or mass of the black hole. So now you have, uh, for example, you have, um, you have a bulge radius, so let's now come back into where we want to situate our final supermassive black hole and where we want to model the dynamics. So you have the supermassive black hole that is sort of orbiting in the galaxy. Galaxy has a mass mg and has a bulge radius rg, so this is sort of the typical time scales. So for example, um, we know at the center of the Milky Way, the mass of the black hole was measured to be, and I think it was Prajwal who showed us that very nice uh, movie from the UCLA, Andrea gets his group, where you can see the orbits and the orbit of SO2, this um, star in the, near, uh, in the innermost regions of our galaxy is what actually gives us this tight constraint on the mass of the central supermassive black hole. And you infer that from the motions of the surrounding stars, which you saw already yesterday. So essentially now we have our various elements now in place to then put it into a model where we can then forward model in cosmic time, tracking the, um, the abundance of black holes, the number of black holes that you have uh, in the lambda CDM context, how each of the black holes is growing in a population, 
the various time scales and processes, dynamical processes, the impact of mergers. So what happens when you kick another black hole in, how long it's going to take to siphon in, et cetera. So for a spinning Kerr black hole, so obviously I've told you, right? So one could make a simple assumption and completely ignore spin, uh, which isn't quite right. We are missing some features, obviously, if we do that. But, um, or you can keep track of the spin evolution. So for spinning black holes, you are completely characterized by M, uh, M and A, the spin parameter. And, and so this, you know, you have the breakup speed, which is A is maximally one, is what um, limits the spin of the black hole. And um, the circular orbits have, so this is why we were looking at the ISCO. This is just sort of putting together what we've done so far, sort of. And so you have an ISCO radius, and, and essentially, we are now able to understand how to bring the mass down to the ISCO, right? Now, um, we saw the Eddington limit, um, and that we saw that this luminosity, um, the Eddington limit, this luminosity implies a minimum mass for the central object. And therefore, one way, um, and I think this was mentioned yesterday, how do you infer the masses of black holes? So one way in which it has been done is looking at the spectrum and seeing that it's an AGN, looking at the integrated bolometric luminosity, and making the assumption that it is uh, accreting at the Eddington rate, and that this luminosity is representative, therefore, of Eddington accretion onto a central object, then you back out the mass. Okay, you get a mass estimate. It's not totally accurate, but it's a first shot. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the, the, the overall luminosity, so it turns out that only a very small fraction of the rest mass energy is anyway converted into radiation. But we are dominated in the output, not from just the, um, uh, the, uh, you know, the luminosity from the disk itself. We, we know when we look at the spectral shape, as we'll see in a minute, which part of the spectral energy distribution is dominated by the disk versus which is dominated by the actual accretion process. So we, since we have, that's why I said we need the spectrum to know that, and then we can actually calculate which portions of the, um, of the total luminosity, the bolometric luminosity, can actually be, that's why it's inaccurate. It's, not, it's just an order of magnitude estimate for the mass. You can be, often be off by a factor of two in the mass. It turns out, yeah. It doesn't have to be. It's just a simple model. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have it, like, you know, we have more viscosity, then mass will just dump at the center and not move. Right? right, right. It would collect. So you have these other geometries where you don't have a steady thin disk that forms, where, and therefore you can have um, much higher than Eddington rates, in which case you don't have this geometry anymore. You have a quasi-spherical geometry in those cases. And then there are cases where um, you can also have a geometry like a torus. So there are many different geometries that you can have, but this is the simplest one that you can do analytically all the way, and you can do it in a self-consistent way and sort of connect. That's the reason for doing this example in detail. So this comes to use the question you were asking. I mean, does, is, the, is the Eddington limit really the be all and end all for a black hole? And it turns out that you really are not, because if radiation could somehow escape without pushing matter away, then you, know, you can exceed the Eddington luminosity. Basically, what, and radiative transfer solutions, and I alluded to this yesterday, GRMHD calculations are now suggesting, especially if you put in magnetic pressure as an additional um, source of non-thermal pressure in uh, accretion disk, you find um, that you can circumvent, easily circumvent the Eddington limit. And in fact, in simulations that Jim Stone and others are doing, Wan Fei Fang, um, that they find that you can exceed the Eddington rate by factors of 10, 15, whatever, what have you. Um, but, um, you know, in nature, at this moment, because of this, because of this connection between geometry and uh, luminosity output and mass accretion rate, we have not yet actually conclusively seen a source 
which is highly super Eddington. We believe that, uh, and I'll talk about this tomorrow briefly when I talk about my own work, that, um, that it, since it's permitted, nature permits you to do that, because we don't see them, basically it means that you could have sources that have very brief episodes of super Eddington, episodic super Eddington, especially early on in the universe. And what you find is that um, you know, models actually incorporate that and permit that. Okay, so um, so I'm just going to do one toy model. Yep. It could. So that's a that's a yeah. It could depend on the depending on the accretion rate, the disk mass, the black hole mass. Yes. There are cases, and you know, and there are cases where also you can have excretion, I hate that word, excretion disks. So mass doesn't actually flow in, but it's actually expelled. Yes, you can have spin flips. Yeah, you can have spin flips. Yeah. Yeah, so the, many of the open questions in that problem are that, um, I think it was mentioned that, you know, ideally you expect, so what we don't know yet is when two supermassive black holes merge, you know, what are the circumstances in which they have, you have this situation, they are in the center and they carry their own individual accretion disk versus obviously when they are both sort of embedded in one sort of circumbinary disk, right? So we don't know what determines which of these two scenarios works, and the, which is why, and for both of these, the signatures, the precursor, postcursor, electromagnetic signatures accompanying the merger, the gravitational wave signature is different. And we, so it's still sort of an open question, it's debated, uh, people fall on either side. I'm open to both, I think both of them can happen, and it's, uh, we just have to figure out what are the circumstances. Uh, under which, so what we know quite well is in this kind of case, this is the kind of movie I'll show you tomorrow, where you have something like this. We know how the perturbations will be set up in the disks. We know that this opens up a gap and there's mass flow across the gap and then, you know, that eventually what happens is the inner part of the accretion disk will decouple from the outer part, so on and so forth. And in this case, it's slightly more complicated because this draining, this accretion disk will actually drain and lose all its mass. It will get uh, accreted onto each of these objects and then they will start driving themselves in. So here you could see very different spectral signatures compared to this case, for example. So here you'll have the domination by the accretion disk structure in the emission. So you can infer a lot more about the disk. Here you really don't infer much about the larger accretion disk properties when you see the emission because it's dominated by the emission around the, the individual disk that is associated with the supermassive part. Yeah. Oh, but the flip, the flip, when the flip happens, see the gravitational waves, right? The um, gravitational waves become, you switch from viscosity driven loss of angular momentum to gravitational waves affecting the merger. And that starts when there is a critical separation. I'll show this tomorrow actually. Uh, there's a critical separation and that separation depends on the mass ratio and so on. And um, and so, you know, your gravitational wave signature, so these are much longer lived events for supermassive black holes. As we saw, I think um, uh, we saw the, uh, in the afternoon, I think Antoine showed us, right, that these signatures, when he showed us the uh, events, they can last up to months and years, right? So you start emitting gravitational waves in supermassive binary black hole mergers much earlier than you do in the stellar counterpart case. And uh, so the, the spin flips, if they occur, are going to occur um, at, you know, so, so there's a, there are some sweet spots where they can occur and there could be signatures. We don't yet have a template. So, you know, in these GR simulations, people are trying to do template waveforms, right, for what the uh, waveforms of various mass ratios, et cetera, should look like for supermassive black holes, just as, as they did for LIGO. They're building a library now. But we don't, it's, we are nowhere near as comprehensive a library as for LIGO at the moment. The uh, uh, simulations are very challenging. So uh, if you want to look, I think Manuela Campanelli and Pretorius. So Campanelli has one simulation. 
in which she has looked at the effect of the spin flip on the, on the waveform. But you know, it's a very special, it's like an exaggerated case. It's unlikely how uh, frequently you would see something that dramatic. It lines up very quickly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't know how jets are generated, but we think they are likely generated from the, um, from the interaction of the inner accretion disk with a magnetic field that is threading the hole. So we think like a magnetic field is definitely implicated when we are uh, looking at how jets are generated. Then the jet direction will flip and there are some sources so yes, so there are some sources, there are these X radio sources, right? So these X shaped radio sources, if, if they are actually single black holes, you know, some case it's a binary and that's why you see the X shape. Uh, you have two black holes, you know, and the jets are coming out in different directions. But in the cases where you have a single source, we believe that the X shape radio sources, it's a remnant of the spin flip. We are seeing a remnant of the spin flip. Yep. Well, uh so I probably missed, in both of the cases, spin flip is possible? Pardon? In both of the cases? No, it's more likely in the case where you have a circumbinary disk. OK, and uh, other than spin flip, is there any other kind of difference in GW we will see from this? Oh, yeah, yeah, electromagnetically, series? they'll be very different. Sorry, I'm sorry? Uh, gravitational waveforms, no, not necessarily. I mean, no, not in the waveforms. At, at least that's the prediction at the moment. Because the, the, at least the predictions are at the level where everything is really determined by the mass ratio and the environment. So that's where the simulations are. Ajit and That's right. Except that there might be a lingering signature. The question is the competition between whether it happens before a crit or after a crit, after this critical separation where GW emission starts. So if it happens, you know, right around the same time, you know, when you've reached your critical separation, so you're already receiving gravitational waves, and then it happens. So it's a question of timing at that point whether you'll. Be No, a critical depends on the mass ratio, no? So it is tuned to, therefore, that's sort of what has gone into figuring out which are the mass ratios that LISA will be sensitive to and what, um, what uh, redshift it would be sensitive to. So th it depends on the mass ratio. A crit depends on the mass ratio. And uh, yes, so the LISA band is such that you should be able to see supermassive black hole mergers of anything that is 10 to the 4 and anything else that is one order of magnitude of higher out to redshift of 8. So there was this waterfall diagram that he showed uh, about the events. I'll show it again tomorrow. Um, I'll remember to answer some of these questions with sort of very specific plots because I have the plots. I don't have them on. Yeah. Yeah, it will be much lower, which is why I said it's not that frequent. It's not something, I don't know why everyone is so excited about the spin flip. Um, it, it really is not as likely, yeah. No, because the kind of accretion rate that you need to flip that spin is quite high. And to have that kind of mass supply rate, you need very um, um, fine-tuned conditions. Right, and then there's a hydrodynamic, yeah. That's right, oh, so yeah, sorry, yeah, there's a GR induced spin flip and then there's a hydrodynamic gas accretion induced uh, spin flip. Hydrodynamic. Yeah, yeah, that is the GR. So, but you know, both of them have not been connected yet. Yeah, so yes, Manuela and company. Uh, pardon? No. There isn't, except that we don't understand uh, whether, you know, how do you get down to those initial conditions that give you the GR-induced spin flips. Ultimately, that's what we want, right? It's all about connecting these various scales to see cause and effect, what is going to actually cause the effects that we want to see in terms of signatures. I think there was one more question, right? No? Okay. Yeah. 
Ja. It doesn't matter. You can you can take one or the other as the um, you know, one could argue that the sigma is already there, right? It's the disk that is there. It's easier to talk about the flow because the flow rate is adjusted by the outer boundary conditions on the accretion disk, which in a simulation or whatever you control, you arrange for some accretion rate at a large radius, right, to set up the accretion disk as a steady disk. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, sorry, what's it? Yeah, yeah, it is a non-local statement. So um, essentially what one can see is that, you know, there's a mass supply rate, m dot of r, and this m dot of r, as we saw in the Eddington case, is proportional to r, okay? In the case of uh, super Eddington accretion, Basically, what you have, the, you have the circumstance where most of the mass, instead of flowing in, is actually expelled in an outflow, okay? And the geometry, okay, this is a cartoon. There are better cartoons, there are better models. So the geometry changes in the center. So you no longer have this sort of axisymmetric little disk, thin disk. The geometry changes. And then we can think about how you could have, um, uh, sort of a beamed source. So, and that is the sort of model that we have for this one source, SS433, which we believe we are seeing super Eddington accretion. And I've told you, right, so this is the only, this is um, the only source where you see. And so, and then you can see what happens uh, basically to the photons. So we've seen what's going on with the mass, what's going on with the photons. We think that most of the photons will eventually escape in cones along the, um, near the axis. And essentially, on average, we think the photons will all give up all their entire momentum to the outflow itself after roughly one scattering. So that's a simple model. So I've not gone into, I can show, um, I will give you some references for the various classes of models. The thing is that you can no longer have a simple analytic model, which is self-consistent and nice, that will fit into every other scale picture that we've talked about. But obviously, these um, super Eddington accretion models, um, radiatively inefficient flows are extremely key because in the nearby universe, for its sources in the nearby universe, including the Milky Way and most nearby galaxies, we find extremely low accretion rates. So these are sources that are literally fasting. They're really uh, not being supplied at all. They're not uh, active sources. Whereas the, the reason people like me are obsessed with the thin disk accretion is that by and large, for anything that is quasarish or AGN-ish, that's a very good assumption. And that most of the black holes that are the distant black holes, because I'm interested in the evolutionary story, the distant black holes uh, are accreting black holes, and this is a paradigm that works very well to describe them, okay? And then, if we are going to use the simple paradigm, then in these models, you need to have a way of shutting off the accretion, because, you know, nearby sources are, whatever, are practically shut off their accreting at very low rates, yeah? So there's a geometry, as I said, there's an associated geometry. Uh, there's an associated geometry and there are spectral signatures that will tell you. So when you have a spectrum, uh, we're coming to the spectrum. I'll just move to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean that factor is not, I mean is known, it's taken to be roughly a 10%. And that, but that's for the Eddington rate. So obviously for the um, very sub-Eddington flows, it's much, much lower. And that, is, that has been calibrated by looking at actual sources, figuring out. Yes, it does. It does spin on. So, you know, as I told you, in this very simple model, I've not looked at the detailed spin dependencies for all the variables. Yeah. But yes, it will depend on that. <laughs> 
So again, right, it's a factor. So we have sort of an order of magnitude estimate for what it should be for the various geometries. And each of those geometries corresponds to different flows, different, uh, different properties of how the radiation couples to the flow, to the mass, to the mass inflow. Okay, so now let's bridge this other thing that we're, let, let's now telescope out and say, okay, the cosmological picture, right, into which we have to sort of integrate this sort of smaller scale um, accretion is that you have, um, and, I, and I think Suchetna showed this yesterday, so you basically have mergers which are very frequent, and then you have to make an assumption. So this is, I'm talking, I'm not talking about what happens in nature, right? I'm talking about how we are building a model. So in the model, you have to assume that somehow, because of dynamical friction, where once again, we saw roughly what the process was, is that when you have a merger, the secondary black hole will then merge, and it will happen on a dynamical friction. Uh, time scale. So it happens that the dynamical friction time scale are actually very, very long. So we think galaxies merge, black holes merge, they are there, so nature somehow makes it happen. So we just haven't figured out what the actual physical process is. We have many candidates. So one convenient candidate during mergers, because of the nature of mergers, you deliver a lot of gas to the center. Gas flows, uh, you punch a lot of gas into the center. So you know that there's a lot of gas available in the inner regions. And then you can have gas-affected binary mergers. So we can see that this can happen quite easily. So basically, you have a primary that's sitting in the center in the merged remnant. The secondary gets plopped on to the gas disk that is already in place. And then um, the merger is affected, is gas-driven. Uh, if you can get to this configuration, right? So that's one candidate uh, possibility. And this is a case for which, um, this is a case that we all like because once again, you can calculate time scales. You can calculate typical time scales, you can calculate typical scenarios. And so you can see that this sort of works out and you can actually do it numerically. And I think um, as Suchetna mentioned, so this is, these are what are called the subgrid models. So how you accomplish this is what goes into your subgrid model, right? And why why are we worried about all of these scales? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, it's very important. So the thing that actually determines, okay. I didn't want to spend too much time on this because I was going to talk about it tomorrow. But one of the key things that determines whether you go here or here is that the mass of the disk, when that is comparable to mass of the secondary, right, then you get that. So that's when the gas-driven mergers are effective. Okay, so the reason for trying to couple all of, um, all of these scales and so on into the larger picture of galaxy formation is that, remember, we have these clues from uh, these correlations that are seen that somehow the galaxy really does know about the central supermassive black hole, right? And, um, and then you might say, okay, how does that happen? So it's very cute. You can do a really simple back of the envelope calculation and see, right? So the supermassive black hole mass is very insignificant. The M sigma slope tells you that the mass of the black hole is only about a thousandth of the mass of the bulge, okay? So it's tiny gravitationally. It doesn't pull any weight in the galaxy at all, the supermassive black hole, except in its vicinity, right? It controls everything in its vicinity. And the region, the region of influence is just M, uh, GM over sigma square, MBH over sigma square. And this is just for, this is scaled for a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole. So it's just 10 parsecs. So you know, gravitationally, the black hole dominates, as it were, only within 10 parsecs. But we are seeing effects where it influences one megaparsec. And I think Prajwal showed us these dramatic radio lobes and jets and stuff that extend out to one megaparsec. And that are clearly driven by the black hole. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a real puzzle as to how these scales kind of couple, right? And that there's clearly a lot of uh, physics there. So you, it's much, much smaller than the bulge. So the extent, the size, 10 parsecs is really tiny compared to the bulge, which is of the order of 0.1 parsec, kiloparsecs or so. 0.1 to about 1 kiloparsec is the size of the typical bulge. And um, 
But, 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 this is why it punches more than its weight, right? Which is if you look at the um, energy released in accretion, so that's that 0.1 factor, MBHC squared, you get about 10 to the 61 ergs. Whereas for, this is again for 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole. So these numbers are for those typical cases. And the binding energy of the galactic bulge is roughly the mass of the bulge times the velocity dispersion of the bulge. So that's about 10 to the 58 ergs. So you can see that the potential energy release, obviously not all of this is going to be able to be tapped. It's going to be tapped with some efficiency and so on. But the galaxy actually notices the presence of the black hole because of the energy release, because of how much, so uh, how much more energy can be released in the, and is released in the accretion process. Not all of it, it is tapped, obviously, because galaxies are not, the bulges are not unbound. The bound, bulges are intact. So clearly you're not unbinding them, which means you're not tapping all this energy. You're tapping a small fraction of it, but you have the source there, right? And so this is really sort of the infamous feedback. So this is what we all call feedback. How does, how much of this energy is tapped? We know it's not all tapped because bulges are intact and they're sitting galaxies with bulges with their black holes. So the question is what fraction is tapped? How efficiently it's tapped? and how this energy is then dissipated, okay? So that is feedback. And of course, the reason why this is important is that um, this energy, um, how it is tapped, will de we could determine. So the question is whether this energy is tapped in such a way that it can block and stunt the inflow itself, right? So those are the sort of big questions. So is this feedback positive or is it negative? Is it, i.e., is it conducive to further growth of the black hole or does it stunt the growth of the black hole at some point? So what is, is there a sweet spot? Is there a limit, right? So those are sort of the big open questions. So um, as you all probably noticed, I finished my first lecture now and we have uh, 28 minutes left, oof. Hold on, let me just go to the start. Yeah, okay. So um, what we've seen so far, sort of we wrapped up, you know, I've been wrapping, I'll wrap up the last few things of uh, uh, thin disks, and I showed you the toy model of super Eddington accretion. Then I'm gonna move on to modeling the feedback. And in particular, now I'm going to step into the observational domain to show you what is the evidence what is it that we have to model and explain, right? Uh, and then we will look at these sort of scaling laws. So the goal of all of this is to derive a simple set of scaling laws that we can use in two ways to build these population models and to input for subgrid physics in the simulations, right? So that's what we're trying to extract from a simple version of this problem. And as I mentioned to you earlier, so one of the approaches to solving these kinds of complex problems that I have definitely particularly adopted, uh, which I think is quite fruitful and in general in the field, this is kind of a normal, um, uh, normal technique, set of techniques now, is you start out with a pared down model, the simplest basic model, and look at its explanatory power. How much of the experimental observational data can that simple model explain? And because the data is the data, it's there, it has to be explained. And then depending on where the simple model fails or it's limited, you add the next level of complexity. And then you slowly build the complexity. So because these problems involve a coupling of scales and so many phenomena that they're really, really tricky, right? So then, so that's where I'll hopefully wrap up and let's see if I, I will get to there. So um, I wanted to come back now to why we were looking at the dissipation to then look at how we can calculate the emergent output spectrum from sort of accretion, from the accretion disk and the accretion. So we can think about this dissipation rate and as once again, we have uh, M and M dot dependence note here. And then we saw what the disk uh, temperature could be. And so then we can actually calculate that for each annulus, this is color coded for the annuli that you saw here. So blue, green, yellow, red, just keep that in mind. So then for each of the corresponding black body temperatures, 
you can sum up the black bodies, and that gives you the total disk spectrum. Okay, so the annular black body. So this is also you, you are, we're now building up the spectral energy distribution that we will now compare with the observations and see if it's a good fit, right? So that's sort of where we're going. Right? And so what we see is that actually, so this is real data, sorry, it hasn't come out very well, but that there is this nice black body component that is there, that is seen uh, in, uh, in AGN. So at least we have one piece sorted out well in the modeling self-consistently, right? So um, we see, so what are the features that we see of emission from AGN? So now I'm switching a little bit to the data to see how we need to hone the model now, right? And so the emission ranges, um, huge range in photon energy. So you go all the way in wavelengths, very short wavelengths to very long wavelengths. And the source of energy generation is very compact. And there is a, a significant transport in relativistic jets. That's important because we want to know how much of that energy is going into the jets, powering the jets, right? Uh, so this is a picture that, you know, this was a model that has now sort of been superseded, but by and large, this was sort of the view that, you know, you had. The, one of the reasons I still like this visualization is give you, it gives you a sense of scale. So you could, um, and this, this sort of model was developed to explain the various kinds of AGN, C for one, C for two, various kinds of AGN that are seen. And the idea here was that the, di the diversity in AGN spectra that you see arises from just viewing angle. So you have this thing, and basically whether you view it down here or from here is what tells you what kind of source you end up seeing. But so this is a slide that um, I really like that I borrowed from Mike Iraculous. So this gives you a sense of the scales and the kind of data that we can get that probes that scale. So these are numbers that are for a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole. And uh, it's, it's accreting at 10th Eddington. So it's not super optimal, but it's at 10th Eddington. And everything, of course, scales with the accretion luminosity. So for that, so these are the physical scales that we're talking about. For a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole, 10 to the minus 3 parsec is about 1,000 a Schwarzschild radii. And so this is sort of the broad line region. It's called the broad line region. I think we have a lot of blobs there. The disk structure is not there anymore. So you've now, you're, you're past the inner edge of the accretion disk. You have these blobs, right? So, and this might be the region from which outflows are launched and so on, we believe. Uh, so roughly 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2 parsec, 0.1 parsec, is where you can see sort of these dusty, the edge of a dusty torus that sits around. And one parsec in the case of um, sort of, this is all data that has been inferred from these sort of maser disks. Then when you go further out to 10 parsecs, it's roughly what was referred to in that uh, toy diagram that I just showed you as the narrow line um, region. Uh, so this is something that we just seen um, in um, giant ellipticals. 100 parsecs is where you see a disk of neutral gas and you see some outflowing ionized gas. And then about 1,000 parsec is where you see very large scale outflows. So this is the picture that has been built from data, okay? And so, and then we are just trying to mesh it with our simple models to see what kind of model is consistent. And so this uh, column tells you roughly what are the sources of data. And, and I think the key thing to note here, right, and this is relevant to a lot of the question uh, in the Q&A yesterday, people were asking about binary black holes and dual AGN and merging black holes. This is sort of the resolution limit. So this is sort of unresolved, yeah. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry, yes, I didn't. That's right, and that it could help you resolve, yeah, sources, absolutely. That, that can be added in, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, between point 0.1 and 1, for sure. So RH is the uh, disk the, the dis scale uh, length for the stellar models, in a, so it's the effective radius. Uh, for So RH is the equivalent in um, the half-light radius for a Sersich model. So it's sort of the half-light radius for an elliptical. 
Yeah, but I think you know it. It, it is a. It can do more than where I have put it. Right. It can do a better job than. Yeah. Integral uh, field units. So these are um, these are um, you know spatially resolved spectra that you can get. So integral field units. And so they, you can for nearby quasars. So you know part of the problem, part of the the bind is that there are not as many nearby quasars i.e. Ac actively accreting sources. So if you really want to understand accretion physics and resolve it, right, we don't have as many candidates nearby. Most of the sources near, uh, near us are not accreting at spectacular rates. I'm just going to go through this quickly because I think yesterday it was shown. I mean, this is just sort of, you know, to be slightly pedagogically complete. Uh, so this is showing you the AGN spectrum, and then um, and that the fact is that you know um, across wavelengths, and to show you that there's actually it's not a steady output. There are lots of AGN that flicker. They flicker on very very uh, small time scales. Um, in fact, there um, you know one can do a simple argument with light travel time and figure out that a source that varies in some time t must have a size that is roughly less than CT. And I think one of the interesting new developments that has been um, in the last few years are the sort of class of AGN called the changing look AGN. So these are AGN that vary on very short time scales uh, and rather uh, what appear to be very uh, fundamental change in properties over very small time scales. Uh, and then we also think that there, there is variability. You know, our understanding of variability has been limited by our ability to resolve in time. Right. So what we now find is there are um, a lot of AGN flicker on very short time scales, and that that is a feature. And the reason this is important is then you know our models have to somehow incorporate that. So tomorrow I'll show you some models that we've built where we have put in all these elements. Right. So this is again um, this is showing you the accretion disk, and then there's a corona. There's a hot corona on top, and then there's this uh, so there's a sort of a torus structure that you see. And you know we have good models that kind of are consistent with this kind of structure and the emission that we can compute, the toy model emissions that we can compute. And then from, we see a lot of lines, and so this is from Sarcinius, and you see that you know, the dust in this molecular torus absorbs uh, UV photons uh, from the disk, from the surrounding disk. And then it re-radiates it in the infrared heater to about 100 to 1,000 K. And so you see a lot of um, IR emission. And we believe that the IR emission is coming from the re-radiation in this uh, torus. This is basically just to show you that observationally, we have a reasonably good idea of where the radiation is coming from and the kinds of structures that, that are there. So the goal is that the phenomenology has, it works. How do I connect them to my simple set of theoretical models, right? And so what are all seen? You see narrow and broad absorption lines. Um, and basically, you are seeing some very high velocity outflows up to 0.1c in some sources. And you have very, I mean, you have rather, rather nice high quality data um, with the lines, and you can measure the absorption. And then, of course, there are radio jets uh, that we see. And I think for me, one of the exciting things about these radio jets is really the scales. So you have the source central uh, supermassive black hole here, have these hot spots, and you have these jets. And you know the scales are of the order of 150, 200 kiloparsec. Sometimes they are megaparsec scale uh, jets that you see that, that's in this spectacular case. So this is Cygnus A. So you, can, you basically see these jets that are emanating really from the central source. So obviously, one of the things the models have to, we have the energy there. So some of this energy really needs to be tapped to explain these phenomena, right? So the radio power. So the sum of the radio power, the sum of any mechanical luminosity, the, and the impact of heating on the stellar population, all those forms of feedback. Right? So we have the energy available. Of course, the big question is, how is it partitioned into each of these? Is, is it 1% efficiency goes here? Is it 5%? You know, who knows? So that's what we are all working out. Yeah. It, it probably is, yes. 
definitely. I mean, and in idealized simulations, they find that there is spin dependence, um, not just on the, on the scale, but the amount of energy that you can actually extract from the spin. Right? That's what we believe powers the jets. Yeah, so we don't actually, we think that the way these jets are, so the, the production of jets is actually like a, an ab initio unsolved problem, but we know that there is energy that's available to drive that kind of jet because we know the energy in these jets, we know the power, um, and we know that, um, that we know we have mechanisms like the Blanford's Nyack that show you how you could extract spin energy from the black hole as well. So, um, but it's not a solved problem. Again, it's you know, sort of the loose, loosey-goosey phenomenology is sort of what we have. Okay, so then you also have these outflows, and I just wanted to point out that you know the way you model to see what fraction couples is you, you do sort of simple, um, a cartoon like this, where basically you look at the census of how much energy has gone into the jet, into the lobe, into the hotspot, and then some material might flow back towards the galaxy. So you could have mass falling, this fallback. And so that's relevant because when you want to do subgrid models, these are all the features that you need to take into account. Okay, so then the question is, you know, um, and some of you asked me this already, like, you know, are thin disks really a good, you know, why are you so fixated? They're, they're nice, they're analytical, and it's a prejudice, as I told you. And they hold in many, uh, many cases, as I mentioned. Most quasars, uh, for quasars, this is a good model. But if not, the disk is thick and it's non-Keplerian, it does not cool efficiently, then you know, the pressure is important, and, um, and the disk itself will be, you know, could, would look like, um, like the envelope of a red giant, could be a convective envelope, it could be rapidly rotating. And so this stuff, um, as I said, you know, there's a lot of calculations, there are many models of disks, so magnet, uh, you know, models that include magnetic fields, um, magnetically arrested disk, mad disk, sane disk, thick disk, um, adios, um, ADAFs, REAFs, they're all kind, there's a whole zoo of disk models. Uh, most of those are primarily numerical models. There's a very few cases in which you can do some kind of analytic solution. But the fixation with thin disk has to do with the fact that we can do these really simple uh, models. So, um, so for example, one of these sort of uh, advection-dominated um, uh, uh, models, I think, uh, and audio. So these models have been worked out, and I can point you to some really interesting papers where people have really looked at the physics in great detail. Yeah. yeah. It approximates one, so it becomes comparable to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even in this thin disk, right, my thin disk approximation breaks down. And at some point in the inner region, you have some quasi-spherical stuff. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I cannot, I, I don't know how to model the flows, the accretion rate all that well um, after that anyway. So you, I'd have to make another model assumption. I'd have to embed a model for the inner region to, again, interpolate. It's not entirely self-consistent, you're right. I mean, yeah, so there are some, you know, there are gaps. There are gaps, yeah. Pardon? Not quite, but we know the scales on which it has to occur, that where the, thick di the thin disk approximation will fail, because you will get radiatively puffed up, and so you can actually compute what those scales are. And it is uh, past the ESCO. That's where, yeah, uh, comparable to the ESCO. So um, it's iffy. So we, we can still go with the ESCO for now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, no, it, it's roughly, it's okay. It's not crazy. Except the geometry is not right. 
the photon radius, yeah, yeah. Yeah, between, between there and ISCO for sure. And it probably extends a little bit beyond the ISCO. But by and large, we've assumed that that works self-consistently up to there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Even through the puffed up portion. But there then it depends on, um, um, this was a repetition of some of the slides because I thought I was going to review um, I would have finished it yesterday, and then I <laughs> review it quickly. Yeah, so um, I think that the, um, the, the temperature profile, et cetera, so you know, there's obviously sort of a discontinuity, if you will, so our models can take you there, but I think the, because of how well we can explain the overall output spectrum, we actually think that we are not missing a major piece. What we are missing, though, is with these um, uh, ADAFs, uh, REAFs, ADIOs, all of these kinds of models, is the, remember I told you one key thing is of the mass inflow rate, what proportion actually makes it onto the black hole and what uh, portion actually flows out. We don't, we are assuming that everything that we are measuring at large radius basically makes its way in. And that's an optimistic assumption. And so all those models tell you, they, those models are ways to calculate effectively what fraction you're actually going to take, it, take down to the hole versus what is actually going to be lost in an outflow. And um, so as I told you, that's a big, um, that's another big question mark in the kinds of models. So these are optimistic, and you can think of them as upper limits. Basically, these are upper limits uh, in terms of M dot and so on. Okay, so these are, once again, to remind you, we see these, um, observationally, we see a lot of these sort of scaling, these are, these are the same scaling relations plotted in a bunch of different ways. This is the bulge luminosity, mass of the bulge, um, uh, velocity dispersion, um, and so on. And from various uh, wave bands and surveys, um, and so on. So what you do see is that there is a correlation. And the big open question is that, is this correlation a fundamental, telling us a fundamental feature of how the black hole and stars co-evolve? Do they co-assemble and co-evolve? That's very tempting, because we now know there's feedback and so on. So is there some kind of self-regulation in these two processes? Does black hole growth regulate star formation and vice versa? And is what we see a consequence of that? Or is this just a consequence of the central limit theorem because things have merged? So, you know, a, a galaxy today that you see over here and the black hole that you see here has had a very rich merging history over cosmic time. And so any initial correlation that you might have had could have gotten wiped out, right? So even if, so the open question is whether in the initial conditions, when the seed black holes form um, in pre-galactic sources and the galaxy is assembling, is the co-evolution a feature of the initial conditions or is it just happens chance that over time with mergers, you end up seeing? So that's the open question, right? So I think, for example, that is the question that actually drives most of my research to know what, I mean, is this mere correlation or is this causation, right? I mean, and if this is causation, when is it set up in the early universe? Yeah. Yes, yeah, you absolutely have both. You absolutely have both. That's the answer. Um, and the question, of course, is whether and if we are able to derive these relations observationally at earlier times, it might let you disentangle a little bit what portion of it is coming from actual physical correlation and what portion of, you know, whether the scatter, you know, whether the scatter is telling you more about the stochasticity and the merging history versus, um, and whether the slope, the amplitude, and the scatter. So, are, you know, can you say something about what is the cause? Why do we see the scatter that we see? And also the scatter is slightly different at the low mass end and the high mass end. And, um, and of course, you know, the statistics as these are rarer black holes, the more massive black holes are rarer nearby universe and so on. 
but there seems to be a lot more diversity on the low mass end, a lot more scatter. So there are very interesting things that have emerged now. So, you know, uh, so one, yeah, talking about the Eddington model and the limits of those models. So when we model this population of growing black holes, as I'll show you tomorrow, with just Eddington limited growth, right? Just the Eddington, this entire prescription that I've shown you, we predicted that there should be, um, there should the scatter at the low mass end should tell you something about the initial seeds, that there's like a one-on-one -on -one mapping, right? So it turns out that if you actually have more flexibility in your accretion modes, not everything is Eddington, but there are different kinds of modes you permit, then you lose that one-on-one -on -one correlation. Okay, so, there it's, it's, so I, I'll show you, when I, I kept talking about you know, bells and whistles, I'll show you what kind of refinement is needed, was warranted, and how the models respond, what do you need to add, um, as driven by the data. It's completely driven by the data. Okay? Okay, so I think I mentioned this earlier, that the globally average black hole accretion rate traces over cosmic time, right? So this is, this is the, for a population. So this is for all galaxies in the universe and all AGN in the universe. This doesn't tell you what is happening over time in an individual nucleus, right? This is averaged. But this is telling you something for sure, right? If they are following each other and they are peaking at roughly the same time, that is telling you that you, know, you have enough evidence to start modeling coevolution as a given and then see if this works out, right? So you can look at this M sigma relation and you can say, okay, how can I, suppose I assume that there is causation there, right? And that there is coevolution, there's some kind of self-regulation how does it work, right? Can I look at that snapshot of M sigma and can I figure out? So then one thing you could say is that, okay, there's a back reaction of the accretion flow with the energy emitted. So you have this mass that is flowing in, some portion of the rest mass energy is getting released into radiation, remember, and uh, for the growing black hole. And so if, for example, this luminosity exceeds the energy deposition rate that is needed to unbind the disk, the inner part of the disk, then you, know, you can use that as a limit. And at that point, you will stop the growth of the black hole because you've, you've, you've stunted the feeding, right? So that then gives you a connection, a way to relate the mass of the black hole that is sitting in the potential of the stellar bulge for example. So what you find, and in cold dark matter models, because everything is driven by dark matter halos, you can then relate it to properties of the halo. So what you then find is that you can write out, this is the limiting mass in this event, right? And what you find is that this gives you a very suggestive kind of expression where the mass of the black hole is proportional. So this is the spin of the halo, okay? So you assume that the spin of the halo, the angular momentum content of the halo is reflected in the angular momentum of the disk, right? And so you can then relate the final limiting mass to the angular momentum distribution and therefore the spin of uh, the halo. The fraction of, um, so in this kind of model, this is the MoMA white kind of model for those of you who know it. Um, where basically you have a dark matter halo and some fraction of the dark matter is baryonic matter and that forms the disk. So this is the fraction that uh, forms the disk. So 10% of the halo mass ends up forming the disk. So it depends on that to a very high power and then this is the this, a circular velocity of the halo. So dark matter halo. So what this tells you, remember I was trying to tell you that we want to figure out, is there a way in which we can insert this into the initial conditions? So voila, here we have a nice way where we can relate the properties of the black hole, the final mass of the black hole, to the properties of the halo in which it is sitting. Which means if I use this, I can use this as an initial condition, propagate it over time and see if I land, if I continue to have this correlation. Right? So that's one way to try and understand. And so this is also a model that looks at the feedback, that looks at how 
the energetics of the accretion onto the black hole can be coupled to stop the black hole from growing, right? Then there's another view of feedback. There's another way of thinking about feedback. And, um, you know, Andrew King and his collaborators have been pushing the, those models. And there the feedback from what you have is you have feedback from momentum-driven winds, basically limits the stellar luminosity, and then that regulates the black hole. So here we just said that the accretion onto the black hole itself, which occurs in the context of the gravitational potential of the stars, the halo and the stars, that regulates the flow onto the black hole and limits the black hole mass. Here we are doing the converse. We are saying that feedback from the winds that are powered by the accretion onto the black hole, they actually limit the luminosity of the stars. What they do is they heat up the gas, they prevent stars from forming. Okay, so they quench star formation. So these are sort of two sort of you know two interesting ways. And what is interesting about these two different ways is that they give you slightly different slopes for the M sigma relation. So we are trying to use the M sigma relation as a diagnostic and say, okay, what kind of physics can give you sigma to the fourth or sigma to the fifth? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So no, these are so they are, they are different models. Except you know, in order to implement this model in a cold dark matter scenario, I will have to make some connection with the galaxy and halo. So there is a connection. So here, the galaxy halo connection is very much part of the initial conditions. Whereas here, I have freedom to assume a galaxy halo connection. Which is related to the halo, yeah. So you know, this is, yeah, you, you can connect that to the halo, exactly. That's how it's done, basically, yeah. That's right, yeah. So once again, you just have to make some assumption between how the properties of the galaxy are related to properties of the halo. Um, actually, so it turns out that no, the, the slope is actually in between these two. So sadly, it's not clean cut, yeah. Could you speak a little louder, sorry? Well, it's on. Uh, for the first model, so the halo does not have any like stars or something, it's just a dark matter. Something. You know, it will have all of that. It's just that, you know, we are relating it to the properties of the halo. So the, the halo there also has a galaxy and all of that. Except that we are jumping by this argument because it's the overall potential well, that is the halo, dominated by the halo, not by the stars, that we are saying controls this, right? And in this case, so if you will, at some level, this is a model in which you're coupling larger scales, whereas here, I mean, you still are, but you know, you're doing it through a galaxy halo model connection. Yeah. Of the, of the black holes, yeah. Exactly, and it'll have some bias. Not only will it have bias, but this model, if we go back to early times, I'll show you this tomorrow, that the, this is what gives you a completely different way to make initial black hole seeds. And it turns out that if you follow this through to the early uh, universe, you get a mass for the initial seeds, which is much higher than the population three seeds, remnants of the first stars. So these give you seeds that are about 10 to the four to 10 to the six solar masses from the get go. So right from the start, and it turns out, so that's direct collapse black holes, and it turns out that it comes in very handy to explain something observationally, which is the discovery of more and more distant luminous quasars, redshifts of six, 6.5, seven now, that already they're so luminous that if they're Eddington limited, that's an assumption, then the masses of the black holes already in place when the universe was 10% of its current age, 10 to the nine solar masses. They are rare, but you still need a way to make them. They are not so freakishly rare. So there's a population of them, and we are just seeing the tip of the iceberg right now. I know, and with JWST and stuff, we should uncover that entire population, if it's there. But there are hints that there's a population. 
So it turns out this inadvertently solves another problem. So yeah. Yeah, a few comments on the yeah. on the first relation. Um, there is a dependence on the mass of the disk and and the spin. Of course, parameter. of course, because yeah, yeah. So, I've just removed it. There is a dependence very explicitly here. I've kept yeah. So, um, but the m sigma relation is a little bit. Uh, you know, even though there is a bit of scatter, uh, this would introduce because of the lambda distributions. And the disk right, mass. right, right. So then, the, then you can imagine, right? So the way this works is then you would say that you know what p of lambda as lambda looks like. It's log normal. So then, what that tells you, you can still hang a picture, because what that then tells you is that. Remember, I'm going to use this to start with the initial conditions, right? So what this tells you, so this is the probability distribution of the spin parameter as a function of lambda in lambda CDM models, right? So then that tells you that the initial seeds probably come from the low spin tail of, um, of the um, distribution. So it still hangs fine. It just tells you something. It tells you that then you have the prior in the initial seed formation that you have the low uh, spin uh, halos. And so it hangs because the low spin halos will actually have um, disks in which you have lower angular momentum. So you have to lose less angular momentum if you want to form a direct collapse anyway. So you know it sort of is pretty consistent. So that's what is sort of powerful about this model. I think what is powerful about this model, as I'll show you tomorrow, is you can rule it out. And you know, ideally, one would like to be right, I have to say. And I'm kind of emotionally invested. I shouldn't be. But it, you know, it can be falsified. And I think it can be clear, very clearly falsified with JWST observations. And I'll show you that tomorrow. Yeah, so it's just, hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Sigma to the 5, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it has to do with the fact that you form a pre-galactic disk, and that disk can go unstable. Uh, and basically, it will not form stars. It will not fragment. But you will have these modes that, you know, bars within bars, that will siphon angular momentum very, very efficiently out. And you are already in a low angular momentum situation, so you don't have too much to push out. And you can very efficiently move mass in. And so you can form a central compact object. Much, yeah, much faster, much higher mass for any given halo. Um, and what you find is that you know, right now in simulations, we can't quite follow it all the way to forming a black hole seed. But we have now reached, I'll show you where we are now. We have seen those disks, those pre-galactic disks. We see them siphoning mass to the center. We see bars. We are almost there, right? Yeah, so not me, but uh, the Japanese, because you need huge amounts of computing power for that. Um, but, um, and you know, and so you people have done them in, um, so the simulations that I did, they were sort of more idealized. They were saying that let's start out with a low spin halo. Let me drop gas. Let me see what happens, right? But And that's all you could do then. But there you saw that you could produce these direct collapse seeds. You could, you could go up to a certain point. But now, I couldn't do it cosmologically consistently. I had to take a prior and say it's a low spin halo and so on and so forth, right? But now, you can, in a big cosmological simulation, you actually see the regions that are low spin that are starting to do that. So it's really quite spectacular. 20, we're talking 20 to 15. 20 to 15, you form them in 20 to 15. Yeah. That's right. And, but it can not only that, it can also, it also explains the bright end of the quasar luminosity function at every epoch. You know, the really the high mass end of the black hole mass function. So anyway, I'll just, um, 
stop here and I'll pick up tomorrow uh, from here. Thanks very much, yeah. There was a question? Oh, sorry, Brajwal, I didn't see you. Yeah. Yes, there is no enrichment. There are many other things that you need for this to work, yeah. Yeah, but even at, even with AMR, you can just about get to where we are. I'll show you tomorrow. Uh, adaptive mesh refinement that allows you to telescope in, right, and change your, uh, allows you to have many more cells in denser regions of simulations. And even there, we can't quite get to the scales to see the formation of the black hole. That's right, and but we can't go down further. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Maybe we could take it over the, 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 the. Okay. So, so um, thank you, Priya. So before. Yeah.